Today, we are pleased to have uh, Dr. Catherine Doyle from Saul Ewing to talk about the latest in patenting and just her experience in more than 20 years of patent law and intellectual property uh, that she has. Before that, she had gotten her PhD in virology uh, and was working in uh, biotech. And now she brings all of that experience uh, of a long career to help us understand what the current states are with the patent field. So I will pass it off to Catherine. It is a pleasure to do this, I will say, and I'm really happy that PCI does this for you all every year. I think it's a, it's a great program and uh, I hope uh, you guys get some uh, benefit from it. We're gonna talk about latest trends in life sciences patenting. Um, the issue that, the issues I'm gonna talk about are really, almost threefold. Two of them, two of them are related to what, what gives you sort of a, a, a defensible patent claim. What can you have issue and what and, and be and defend against if it's attacked? And those two issues that we're going to talk about from some recent case law are what we call the written description requirement and patent eligible, eligible subject matter. So in terms of the written description requirement, I'm going to focus on antibodies and I'm going to focus on chimeric antigen receptors, something that's near and dear to a lot of uh, the folks at Penn's hearts. For patent eligible subject matter, I'm going to talk about diagnostic claims because that also is something that has been toppled a bit by recent case law. And it's important, I think, to understand some nuances to those findings. And then lastly, I'm going to talk about uh, inventorship because I work with a lot of you uh, on inventorship issues, and I, it's always good to sort of remind you who is or who is not an inventor, how it's determined. And there's some very recent case law on that as well that I think is important for you all to hear about. So with that, just to get everybody on the same page, and forgive me if this is too simplistic, I'm gonna just go over what a patent application is and what the claims are. Um, so a patent application is a big, it's like a big grant application. It contains the disclosure, all of the text, figures, tables, all of your data that disclose the invention and show the reader the manner and making of using the same. Um, at the very end of the patent application are these numbered paragraphs called the claims. And this is a very precise wording, a precise recitation of the claimed invention, <clears throat> excuse me. And these are in numbered paragraphs at the end of the application. They are, the claims are what the patent examiner looks at to see if you should, uh, if, you, if you, your patent should be allowed, your claims would be granted. And they are also the things that are the, the element of the patent application that are looked at in terms of whether or not there's an infringer. So. So the claims become the most important part of the application. And just again, this very simplistic, so please forgive me, but a very simple claim structure would be a chair. Nobody ever knew about a chair. I'm not sitting on one, you, you're not either. And the chair would be defined as something comprising a seat portion, a back portion attached at one end to the seat and legs that support the seat. And then in dependent claims, and this is the vernacular that's used in the patent laws, the chair of claim one comprising four legs. So claim two is a chair that only has four legs. Claim three is a chair where the seat is a wooden seat. Claim four is a chair where the back is made of leather and so on. So you see this sort of funnels down like a cone in some respects. You start with something that's really quite broad and then you narrow down to something that's more narrow. When you're uh, looking at these claims, you may be asked when the patent examiner is examining these claims, the initial claim one here may be really too broad because it's any chair known to man. It's a swivel chair, it's a bench, it's a whole bunch of different chairs. And the examiner may say, there's tons of prior art out there. You're not gonna be allowable. I need you to amend the claims. And what you do is let's say you, you cancel claim two, you take the word four and you insert it into claim one. Now the scope of claim one is only a four-legged chair. 
It's not any other chair, it's a four-legged chair and so on. So that's just sort of the anatomy of, of claims. And if you think about how these would be written in terms of antibodies or, or other things, you can imagine the words you would put around those claims and we'll deal with some of those as, as the talk proceeds. Um, how are the claims construed by the patent office and by the courts? They are supposed to be construed as having the broadest reasonable interpretation. So that first broad claim I showed you would be kind of any chair. That would be the broadest reasonable interpretation. The amended claim would be any four-legged chair. Could be made of tin, wood, leather, plastic, whatever. It should be the plain meaning of the words in the claim, unless in the patent application, you say very specifically what elements of certain elements of the claims mean. And in order to look and see what the claims really mean, you read the whole patent application, you look at the claims, and then you look at the plain meaning, and you'll look at what could be inferred by any arguments made in the patent office around what the claims mean. And it's that scope of claim that then is sort of the thing that's fought over. So the claims are assessed by the examiner to see if they satisfy basic uh, the statute that governs patents, which is 35 USC. But there are really five elements that, that are looked at. Utility, non-natural, novel, non-obvious, whether they're enabled, and whether they satisfy the written description. Before I get into those features and how you um, to, to see whether you sort of assess whether you do or don't satisfy them, I did want to just remind you that if you disclose your own invention or if others have prior to when you file, that public disclosure can negate the patentability of your claims. And I wanted to just tell you what a public disclosure is, because some people don't think this through as much as they might. It's a scientific article. That kind of makes sense. It's an article that might be up on a website that isn't yet peer reviewed. It's anything that the public can see. Okay. So it's also a thesis, which is cataloged and available in a library. It's an abstract for a meeting that really describes the invention in some detail, or an abstract of a government grant, which is available to the public after the grant issues. It's a public talk or poster. Even if the public talk isn't recorded, it's still a disclosure. It's, and that, that could be any public talk that's open to people outside of your own institution, if it's within your department or something. And it's of course, any public talk that you give in public. It's also a funding or a partnering pitch where you don't have a confidentiality agreement. So you set up a slideshow to, to try to get funding for your research and or your startup company. And if you don't have a confidentiality agreement, you may not, in fact, uh, you, you may have negated public patentability by publishing your invention before you filed. So be very careful about what a publication may or may not be or a public disclosure. And if you're in any doubt, please go to the good folks at PCI who really do know the difference and they can help guide you on that. All right, this is just a timeline of, of filing and I'm not really going to go into that in detail, but if people have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Basically, there's different sort of strategies of filing different types of applications within uh, the patent office and patent offices across the globe. So let's go to non-natural. Can't be a natural thing. And that now has been defined Nucleic acids, proteins, or antibodies that are normally found in nature, even if they're isolated away, are no longer considered to be patentable. And that has huge implications on diagnostic testing, and we'll talk about that in, in more detail in just a few minutes. Novelty. That one's easy. The identical thing can't be out there. So whatever you're claiming has to be different from what's already out there in the public domain. Non-obviousness, this is a hard one and it's one that we deal with a lot in uh, patent law where the, um, when science advances, the idea that you've made one invention and it was a large leap from what was known before, 
Sometimes that large leap, because the technology becomes so much more advanced, is a tiny leap. And so obviousness is something where the goalpost kind of changes a lot. So if you're arguing non-obviousness, what you have to argue is nothing in the prior art, the public domain, would have motivated or suggested anybody to arrive at what you did. There was no likelihood of success. And the best thing is if in the prior art, people would sort of say, Pshaw, that's not going to work at all. And, and that would be sort of no motivation, no suggestion, no likelihood of success. And in fact, kind of teaches away from what you arrived at. All elements in the invention are not present in the prior art is another way of arguing non-obviousness. Other people tried and failed, unexpected results, that kind of thing. But obviousness is something we argue with the patent office all the time. And obviousness is something that's often argued in the courts. Enablement. This is a, a kind of an easy one in that what's written in the patent application must, must teach others how to make and use whatever you have claimed. If you don't teach how to make and use, then you're not satisfying that contract that was embodied in the constitution, which says, I'll show you my invention and in return, you'll give me a patent. And when I have my patent, I can exclude you from practicing unless you pay me money, okay? So, so enablement is very important. And that's why we often, in a very repetitive way, when we write these applications, we write a lot of words. Written description, we're gonna spend a little time on this. It must describe what the invention actually is in terms of structure, sequence, or other identifying features. And then everything that I've just talked about is examined in terms of what those claims actually say. So looking at antibodies, any, any antibody, they're, whether they're patentable or not, are treated the same. Small molecules like chemical structures versus proteins are treated the same way anymore because it's really easy to sequence anything. Before, they weren't treated quite the same, where the small molecule could be granted in a claim as a composition if you showed its structure. But the protein, or specifically the antibody, could be claimed if you told people what it did. Now, you're being asked to write in your patent application, not just what it does, but what it is. And that's the written description requirement. So this gets kind of complicated with antibodies because we, we still often characterize antibodies by what they bind to rather than what they are. And when you find a new antigen or a new target, and then you know that you know you pan and you develop you you identify antibodies to which which bind to that target. That used to be sufficient for patentability under the written description requirement, but unfortunately, that is no longer true. As you all know, there's tons of different antibodies. I don't have to belabor this slide, but almost all of them now can be sequenced very rapidly, and when you get to things like monoclonal antibodies. You can, in fact, define them. Even if you don't sequence them, they emerge, they're made in hybrid, from hybridomas. And if you deposit the hybridoma, say in the ATCC at the time you filed, that's considered to satisfy the structural requirement because anyone else can go to the ATCC and pull out that hybridoma and have your antibody in hand, and then they know what they have. So if you don't deposit the hybridoma, you should sequence the antibody. And amino acid sequence information is required to satisfy the written description requirement, specifically sequences of the CDRs, though you can also disclose sequences of the heavy and the light chains. And then you should also disclose and talk about and show structure for specific modifications like chimeric or humanized or however you've modified the antibody. So, if your claims have to describe the sequence of an antibody, the pros for that are very easy to prosecute. You know exactly what it is, you know exactly what's in the prior art, you can tell the difference between the two, and you should be able to pop out 
allowable patent claims very quickly. But the con is that it's really easy for a competitor to design around by just say, substituting one amino acid sequence for another or one amino acid residue from another, okay? So in Amgen v. Sanofi, this is a case that came down in 2017. There was a dispute over PCSK9 antibodies, these lower levels of LDL, so they're great, right? Because LDL is very hard to lower even with, with ordinary statins. Amgen has one product, Rapatha, and Sanofi has Prelude. Preluent, I think is how you pronounce it. Amgen files a patent application. And here's what Amgen's claim looks like. It's an isolated monoclonal antibody wherein when bound to PCSK9, the monoclonal antibody binds to at least one of the following residues. So look at this now. The monoclonal antibody is being defined by the residues on the binding partner, the antigen to which it binds, okay? And even then they give a sequence, you seek ID number three, they show the sequence on the binding partner, the PCSK9, not on the antibody itself. The court noted that the patent didn't include a deposit of the hybridoma. It didn't just include any, uh, any monoclonal antibody by amino acid sequence and the antibody was solely defined by its function. Now, in the old law, Amgen said, well, PCSK9 was not known to do this, so we satisfy what we call the newly characterized antigen test. We found a new antigen, we found an antibody that bound to it, we satisfied everything the law required. And Sanofi, uh, according to Amgen, was infringing Am Amgen's claim. So Sanofi said, well, all right, we don't care if we're infringing, your claims are invalid, and asked the court to find that the claims were invalid. And the court did that. Um, let me see. Okay. So the court came out and said that the written description requirement must be met by disclosing a su sufficient possession of antibody species. And in this patent that was at, uh, in contest here, there were no sequences to any antibodies. So they also said, because sequencing is now so easy, the newly characterized antigen test no longer satisfies the written description requirement. And therefore they found that Amgen's antigen-based claims were not valid as to the antibodies. And the, the rub here is that this applies to pending patent applications today where they were filed at a time when sequencing maybe was harder. And that doesn't seem fair. So the law today is that antibodies have to be def defined and claimed based upon their structure, not their function. There's no exceptions. And the antibodies are to be claimed based on specific amino acid sequences. All right. Where does that leave us? Well, if you're going to claim antibodies, which are used as therapeutics, you really should have sequences of the antibodies and you really should disclose at least the sequences of the CDRs. And you should try to disclose more than one sequence. And this is hard for university-based technologies because you're always trying to file early because you want to beat publications, you're trying to get grants, and you don't have time to go around trying to sequence a whole bunch of antibodies. So it's a tough one for university-based technologies because you're trying to file early and you may not have all the information that the law would require for you to get broad claims. Okay. Um, let me just, all right. Let's go to something that's now very recent. This came out just a few weeks ago. So Juno Therapeutics makes cars with, and they license technology from Sloan Kettering. And Kite Pharma, as many of you on this Zoom may, may know, has a commercialized car product that they sell. Kite has a, the Kite's product is called Yescarta. And Kite's product 
is made up of an anti-CD9 single chain antibody, a CD28 co-stimulatory region, and a CD3 zeta region. And Juno alleged that Kite's, yes, Carta, was infringing Juno's claims which were to a nucleic acid encoding a CAR, comprising a CD3 zeta, a co-stim region, which would be CD28. And here's the rub, a binding element that interacts with a selected target. And then in dependent claims, that element was a single chain antibody. And in more dependent claims, it bound to CD19. Juno's patent application was filed very early. I, I can't remember the date off the top of my head now, but this was way back when sequencing was harder. And when Juno alleged that Kites Yescardo, Yescarda infringed Juno's patent, Kite properly, as anybody would do in this lawsuit, countersued saying that Juno's claims were invalid. And the federal circuit agreed with Kite just three weeks ago. They said Juno's claims were invalid because the patent contained no sequences of any single chain antibody, let alone any anti-CD19 single chain antibody. So Juno's claims were far too broad compared with what was supported in the document that was filed because there was not one single chain antibody sequence in there, let alone the one that they were asserting over Kite. Um, so Kite won. Juno says they're gonna, they're gonna appeal to the Supreme Court. Since this follows the Sanofi case, I'm not entirely sure that the Supreme Court's gonna pick this up because they only do that when, when there's real sort of new law being made. And in this case, it's not really new law to say that an antibody embedded in a chimeric antigen receptor structure shouldn't also have a sequence compared with the antibody claims per se, where in Amgen v. Sanofi, the court said they, they should be defined by sequence. I'm gonna stop there for a minute. I don't see anything in the chat, but does anybody have any questions? And if you do, can you go ahead and unmute? Hey, Catherine, uh, this is Bob Shankle. So I guess one thing that seems a little inconsistent is that <clears throat> with small molecules under the doctrine of equivalence, if you, make one substituent change that doesn't change the activity, it's you know said that it's it's obvious, but if you make one amino acid change in a monoclonal antibody, even if it doesn't change the activity, what I'm hearing is that you can get a patent on that. Isn't that somewhat inconsistent? Actually, I, I think, um, Bob, I don't, maybe I didn't quite understand your question, but let's say, you define the antibody by a sequence. And let's say in your disclosure, you say that conservative substitutions of that sequence are possible as long as the function doesn't change. The court should allow a claim to, you know, an antibody defined by seek ID number one, let's say, and any conservative substitutions that don't change the function. Now, now that should be allowable provided in your application, you disclose seek ID one, and maybe you talk about where some of those conservative substitutions would be placed. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, it does. <clears throat> because okay. it's a little broader than I initially thought. Yeah. And the, the other way to get around this a little bit is also you say, I claim an antibody of seek ID one and anything that's, let's say, 98% identical. Mm -hmm. okay. And now that allows for a bunch of substitutions without having to disclose a bucket load of sequences. Does that help? Yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks, Catherine. Any other questions? Hi, Catherine. Uh, this is Tracy Chen, also from PCI. Um, I had a question regarding, you know, when they, the two cases you talked about when it, you know, invalidated the patent claims. So, what happens next? Does it become kind of a free for all? Like anyone can develop products in the space or, or you know, they still have to file, you know, new patent app, you still need coverage on, on like um, new structures with seek IDs. That's a great question, Tracy. Um, so when a patent is invalidated, it, all it means is that someone can't assert that patent 
over a third party infringer, right? Because that means that anybody now can practice that technology. It's basically donated to the public. So it does become a free for all for folks who want to work that particular technology. So in Juno's case, you would think that somebody could just roar back in now and have a Yes Carta-like product. So CD19, CD38, and CD3 Zeta, and they could practice that claim without worry of infringement. But what if Kite themselves has their own patent to their very specific Yes Carta product? And I haven't looked at Kite's patents in years, but I would guess they do. So now whoever is practicing in Juno's technology may in fact infringe Kite's technology and Kite's patent. I and I could be you. facetious and say, this is just a patent attorney's dream because all we get to do is keep helping people fight each other. But specific claims that are invalidated, people can practice that as if it was donated to the public, provided they don't infringe someone else's patent in the same area. I see. And uh, another follow-up question is, is the federal circuit like the final decision or can you still appeal that? The, the Supreme Court is the final decision, but they only pick up cases where there's really a serious error in the law applied by the federal circuit, or it's really sort of something that would be revolutionary in terms of new law. Um, I'll eat my hat if they pick this one up on appeal, because it really follows, the, the whole reasoning follows the Amgen v. Sanofi case. And I would be very surprised that they would want to get into the weeds of this particular part of patent law um, when they, you know, obviously have a lot more that they could have on their docket. I do think that um, Juno will appeal. They're very litigious. Um, so they'll, they'll ask for um, cert um, with the Supreme Court. And if the Supreme Court doesn't want to take it up, they'll deny cert, which will mean that this is now the last step this federal circuit ruling. That's really good. Um, I mean, applying the previous ruling from 2017 to this case, I mean, how old was Juno's IP? Um, and applying retrospectively requirements uh, on older filing, um, isn't that a bit weird? and setting up for actually uh, a lot of invalidation. Oh yeah, that's, that's what's really sort of interesting about this is let's say, I mean, when the Myriad decision came down about the uh, nucleic assets not being patentable, yeah. that was retroactive for all patents that were in force at that mm -hmm. time. And every single one of them could be now considered to be invalid. Mm -hmm. But the picky piece about this, Vivian, is that let's say there's a different patent covering a nucleic acid sequence. It technically has not been invalidated by the court, but it could be because mm -hmm. of Myriad. And now your licensee is coming to you and saying to you, well, I'm not going to pay on the license because those nucleic yeah. acid claims are invalid. Yeah. And, and your answer to them is, well, it hasn't been invalidated in the court. Yes, we agree, you know, there is this holding in Myriad, but maybe there's some specific facts in our case that would continue to uphold our claims. I did this with, with one of your uh, counterpart universities where literally the minute Myriad came down, their patent was challenged by the licensee as, you know, I'm not gonna pay you now because it should be invalid. And our answer back was, well, this patent, our patent here has not been invalidated We'll negotiate a real step down on the license, but we're not going to tell you that you don't, you know, you shouldn't pay on the license. So it was a bit of a standoff mm -hmm. because then the licensee could say, well, so sue me. And if the university wanted to do that, it's a lot of money, but the licensee gets to pay a lot of money too. So everybody got kind of scared. Yeah, no, that makes sense. It's just uh, going back retrospectively seems to be. Um, one, maybe arbitrary, but two, um, putting in, in, in jeopardy a lot of businesses. It does. 
it does. And because it's retroactive, it 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 sort of turns things on its head yeah. In, yeah. in hindsight. Yeah. So the job of the patent attorney is to try to predict what the court's going to do, <laughs> which is hard, <laughs> and then try to cover what they might do years down the road, which is harder. Right? Yeah. OK. You're welcome. All right, I'm gonna very quickly go through this because I know we're, we're gonna run out of time actually soon. Um, this is the new and useful thing. So 35 USC 101 says you can patent something that's new and useful, but you can't patent something that's a law of nature, a product of nature, including DNA or protein or algorithms or perpetual motion machines. And that turned the diagnostic industry on its head as you all know. Um, detecting the presence of something in the body, sort of what I think of as looking and seeing and thinking about it is not patent eligible. So you can get patent claims in the diagnostic field if you sort of do a little trickery. So here's a claim that's not eligible. You determine whether or not a human patient has rheumatoid arthritis, look for a marker in the sample, compare the marker to a control. And when you see the marker, at least twofold higher than the control, you say in your head, the patient has RA. That's ineligible under this law. If on the other hand, you say, I'm gonna have a claim to a method of treating arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis in a patient, looking for the level of the RA, comparing the detected marker to a control, wherein it's at least twofold higher, the patient is administered an anti-RA treatment. There is now a step in here that's what the court calls the hand of man, which is the treatment step. I, I look, I saw, and I decided that I had to administer this treatment. So those are eligible, the others are not. And, and that, um, since we're, we're coming up on the clock, that's kind of what I wanted to say about that, just to remind people that natural products, DNA, protein, even though they're extracted, may not be, aren't, aren't patentable anymore. If you purify them or make combinations of them that are not found in nature, that give them really different characteristics, then they could be patentable. And then things that are patentable that we use all that we, we claim all the time is panels of biomarkers, where we're looking at pattern and not we're looking for the presence or the absence, but panels of biomarkers as a composition, sort of, if you'd like for use in the detection of a disease, they would be patentable because the presumption is those panels of biomarkers are not found naturally in the blood. Panels of antibodies that are not found naturally in nature. Those kinds of things are patentable, whereas, um, things that you just sort of pick out of nature no longer are patentable. And then the really important piece, because we deal with this with a lot of investigators where they find a new biomarker and it's fabulous. And now they know they can detect some awful disease, but the looking, the seeing and saying they have the disease, that's not a patentable invention. We have to torque that into a method of treatment in order for it to be patent eligible. Catherine? Yes. Does that also uh, eliminate if you have a uh, cutoff value EI, you have five biomarkers and you put them in a formula and if um, the end result is above 2.5, then the person is going to develop cancer. It's below 2.5, the person is safe. Is yeah. that tangible or is that um, basically a manipulation of what's already existing in nature, so not so much. Well, if you're looking at the five in, say, the blood, yeah. normally where we're looking for these things, and they're there, and you see them, and they're mm -hmm. higher, 2.5, that's the look, see, and thinking about it kind of thing. Yeah. But if you look, see, and now you know, and then you treat, okay. that should be patent eligible. Okay. Okay. And then the last thing I wanted to, to talk about was inventorship, because I, I know that this is near and dear to a lot of your hearts. And it's, it's also, there, there have been, there, there's one new case since um, 
last year that has become quite important in this area. So just reviewing the law as it stands, a patent application must name the correct inventors. If you don't name the correct inventors initially, that's okay. You can go back and fix it if new information comes to light, if the investigation wasn't as thorough as it could be, as it often is the case in early stage uh, patent technologies. And the important thing is, is that there can't be any sort of deception in the, the naming where you leave someone off because, oh, they belong to another institution and we don't wanna to have to deal with them. Or if you put someone on because that's convenient because you're trying to appease them or they're your funder or something. So you have to name who the true inventors are and you have to do it with sort of veracity, if you will, rather than you know, kind of be cute about it. The other important thing is it's a legal determination, not a moral decision. So it's a legal determination based upon an analysis by a patent attorney it's not putting people on a paper because they did the work and they deserve the acknowledgement and they're trying to get a really good postdoc or whatever it is that they're doing. You can do that on a scientific article, but you can't do that on a patent application. So ownership resides on the inventors unless they assign. And of course, in any university system, the inventors must assign to the institution that's part of their employment agreement. It's part of their participation agreement. And then each co-owner owns an undivided interest in the entire patent. So that's kind of, you know, you buy a house with somebody in, in a joint ownership uh, way. You don't own the top and they own the bottom. You don't get the kitchen and they get the bathroom. Everybody owns the house. So you have an undivided interest in the whole. And the important piece is a joint inventor who contributed to only a small portion of the invention still has an undivided interest in the whole patent. So you could have somebody who came up with the big idea and somebody else who came in and kind of tweaked that a bit and that someone else who came in and tweaked it is still a co-owner and a joint owner of the whole, okay? And that's, that's really important. So what is, invention is decide, decided by who conceived of the invention conception. And it's, the law says, a definite and permanent idea of a complete and operative invention, including every feature of the subject matter sought to be patented. And that's important to sort of keep in your head. It means it's not necessarily the person that did the experimental work. It can be both of those people, or that person can do both. But it's, it's the person who had the big ideas, the intellectual input. And often when I talk with you all about who is or who is not an inventor, when we look at new disclosures, we ask who had intellectual input into the claims rather than who, who did the work. And, and again, they can be one and the same, but if they only did the work, then they may not be inventors. Joint inventors don't have to physically work in the same place, same time, make an equal contribution. The, but, but the only issue about joint inventors is there must have been a collaboration between them. So if you have two investigators in two different departments at Penn who are inventing in parallel and they weren't ever collaborating, they're not joint inventors, even though they're looking at the same thing. If you have somebody who's collaborating and that collaboration broke down, but the invention still led to something, it's quite possible you still have joint inventors. Okay, even though one might have gotten angry with the other and, and uh, the collaboration ended. So joint inventorship problems are always those where, you know, we, we look at for you all and for, for other clients, we have collaborations that don't go well, where people begin to disagree. One group begins a project, another takes it over, but there really wasn't a collaboration. It was a handing off. And that would happen when a modified cell is invented, say, by one party for which a use is discovered by another party. If there was a modicum of collaboration in that third case, they would consider to be, be considered to be joint inventors. You could see where, where one lab at Penn would modify a cell and then say, this person works on multiple cirrhosis over here. I'm going to give them my cell to see if they can find out if it works. That's actually a collaboration. It's a continuing 
sort of advancement of the work that they're doing. New law, Dana-Farber versus Ono Pharmaceuticals. This came out very recently and, and it was a very long and involved, tortured sort of on and off collaboration between really three groups rather than two, looking at PD-1 checkpoint inhibitors. And in this tortured story, which I don't have time to go into for you all, what happened is two of the collaborators actually had published a, a small portion of the research before the patent application that was in contest around the inventorship was filed. And that's really weird. You would think if a little bit of the invention was published before the patent application was filed, by definition, that little piece isn't a part of the invention. The invention starts when the application was filed. But the court found differently. First of all, a little bit of the invention that was published did not negate patentability of the final claims. And secondly, they were still collaborating after the patent application was filed. And so the Federal Circuit said in this case that research that's made public before the date of conception of the total invention can qualify as a significant contribution to conception of the total invention. And they said, because conception may take place over a long period of time and contributions and, and would involve different contributions from the parties. So you can't discount a genuine contribution to conception by some collaborators because portions were published. Now it's kind of a hard one for, it was hard for me to wrap my head around, but really what, what the case said to me, it was less about the publication aspect of this but more about the fact that collaborations themselves, they can wax and wane and, and weave and personalities change and labs switch up. But if there's a collaboration going on and conception, which doesn't, it's not kind of a light bulb of, oh, this is the invention. It's a long story about, in this case, identifying checkpoint inhibitors. And, and their, their real meaning in terms of treating cancer. The court said the folks who started off on this road with the fellow who finally, Ono, who finally uh, filed the patent application are inventors. And so the court added the Dana-Farber uh, inventor onto the application. And I think it was Genetic Institute or one of, one of the Boston companies also had someone that was added on. So when we look at inventorship for you all, we really want to look at the story behind the invention and who were the people who were contributing to the intellectual pieces of it. And I'll leave you with one last thing here where let's say someone comes up with a big idea and then he goes to his postdoc and he says, make it work. And the postdoc starts looking at the best ways to make it work. And the postdoc comes back to the PI and says, it's not gonna work quite the way you thought. You're going to have to change this one thing. And that one thing that got changed makes it into the patent claims. That postdoc now is a co-inventor, even though he never came up with the full concept, but he tweaked it enough. And that tweak was sufficiently inventive and intellectual to make its way into the claims. And so he becomes a co-inventor. Those are the places where we end up with sort of the biggest fights around inventorship, whether it's company university within the university or university to university, where we, we really are looking to see whether or not somebody made a major contribution, even though the general big concept had already been discovered. And that's a little subtle, but it's, it's very important to try to get those correct inventors named properly on the applications. Questions about any of it all? Have at it. We've got a few more minutes, right, Jessica? Yep, I'd say five more minutes. Um, it's began again. Sorry, I don't want to ruin your plans. Um, <laughs> let's assume uh, a lab is working on a problem that um, hasn't been solved in years, right? And there's that progression of 
small like small contribution from different postdoc uh, research assistant or technician and then leading to a haha -ha moment where actually it is now patentable it was it's working it's reduced to practice so when the inventors are listed on that patent application the attorney and, and TLO needs to look back, need to look back at the full history to say, well, who contributed to the making of that invention? Or are we limiting ourselves to looking at the claim and who contributed to it? Well, so the invention is defined by the claim. And now yeah. if you if if that claim embodies sort of a long story of how they arrived at the claim, mm -hmm. where, where some folks years ago were working on the problem and wasn't really working, wasn't working, wasn't working. Along comes the postdoc, who kind of just fits the thing together. Mm -hmm. They're all co-inventors. Because you could imagine the postdoc wouldn't even know what the problem was without all the work that the folks had done prior to that. OK, thanks. That's super useful. You know, as a practical matter, we look at inventorship for all our university clients and even our, our small company clients. We look at it in a relatively, you know, we ask questions, we talk to them. It's part of the process before we file, if we have time. And then we try to do it <laughs> straight after if we don't have time. But, but then we kind of just sit on it. Right, because we don't even know if this thing is going to make it, if it's going to be viable or anything. And now maybe there's a found, you know, a company is founded or something, and things get a little more, more um, uh, sort of solid around the advancing this technology. And when that happens, we we go back and we take another fresh look. Anytime any other person raises the a claim that they should be an inventor that's when everybody has to really take a good look as well because mm -hmm. you have to name the right inventor so if somebody comes along and says i was in that lab and i made that observation and it was tiny but it was critical we have to go back and re-interview and look at corroborating data and make sure that those folks are inventors or not but we have to do the due diligence it's a it's a bit of a it's an expense when the stuff is early and you hope these rows don't happen at that point, but it has to be done in order for the patents to be enforceable. The, the fun part about this is if the inventorship is incorrect because of some sort of deceptive intent, the patent still stands, but you can't enforce it. So it's useless. The claims are not invalidated, but it's a non-enforceable patent. So you always have to go back and look if somebody raises the question. And we do have situations where people fall out with each other, there are misunderstandings. And then we have situations where people just genuinely didn't appreciate that some contribution by another person was really critical. And once you talk to them and explain it to them, they're good. Makes sense. Yeah. Anybody have any other questions? I do. <laughs> <laughs> You've um, been great, Vivian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's something that um, I think faculty have um, a hard time to comprehend, which is when there is joint um, multiple inventors on a pattern application, and that, as you mentioned, there's the big ideas and then the small contribution and the uh, equal and divided rights to practice or to the IP, it's something that's unsettling for uh, faculty because of the difference in contribution. How do you explain um, why it is that way and why um, one of the inventors is not able to just, you know, claim its inventorship on, on the, small, the small component. Yeah, I mean, I think once you get the inventorship correct, then sort of totally 
sidebar, if you will, is what was what was the contribution, the relative contribution, say, of each of two inventors? And that's something that they have to decide themselves or PCI helps them decide because if one person had the big idea and the other person came in with a small change that made it into claim 32 to 35, then you could imagine the person with the big idea might be a 90% uh, contributor and the other person would be 10%. It becomes a little difficult. It doesn't change that they each have an undivided interest in the whole, but it does perhaps change what remuneration they might be eligible to receive. Um, if on the other hand, somebody came up with a great big idea, but didn't work until the postdoc or whoever came in and changed it around so that it finally did work. Yeah, you know, maybe that would be a 60-40 or a 50-50. But those are things that aren't governed by the patent laws. They're mm -hmm. really governed by the relative contributions of the, the different parties. Jensen, thank you so much, Catherine. This was really great. You're welcome. Thank you for asking me. Yeah. And Everybody stay safe out there.